So oh, um, let's now look at the layers in this project. What we can see at the moment is an aerial photograph of a Yavla. This is Yavla with the railway station here. And we have Gavla on going through here. Uh, at the bottom on the layers panel here, this is like the contents in ArcGIS, we have this layer called Gavla, which is our aerial photograph. So we can see that the, the, um, the legend for this is just the three colors. You cannot see any of these colors in the, um, in the image where you see the combinations uh, of these colors in the image. So this is not a very good uh, uh, legend for this, but it, it's functional, it tells us what, what is happening there. This is a background image uh, that you will map from. You will create your map from this background image. This will not be a part of your map, this you will uh, hide afterwards, remove it from the project, or just uh, click on this tick mark to get rid of it like that. It's still in the project, but you can't see it. So in your final map, you will not have the support of this uh, photograph. So everything that is in your map, you will have to map yourself. You will have to digitize it from this image. So let's start by looking at how we can uh, do that. Uh, well, we have these uh, pre-installed for this project, I have created these uh, pre-installed layers. We have uh, two polygon layers. We have a line layer and two point layers. Why? It's just a, a sort of thematic uh, structure to this. Um, you can start at the bottom. So the drawing order is uh, because we're in this. Uh, the layer uh, display is in the in the drawing order um, at the moment. So at the bottom, the first thing to be drawn is this uh, aerial photograph. Afterwards comes land use. These are polygons, surfaces, forest, water, things at the base that other things stand upon, so to speak. Um, and we can uh, click on that. There, there are no objects. When, if we get rid of the, the aerial image, we can see there's nothing in any of these layers. They are completely empty, but they have the styling. The styling has been set. So we can create objects that follow that styling later. So this is land use, and we have several different layers. If we right click on the name of the layer here, land use. Uh, we have a whole palette of tools come up. Um, we can look at properties and attribute tables, perhaps they're the two most important. Another thing that I might just quickly point out um, is the zoom to layer thing here. Sometimes if you get lost, you can click on zoom to layer and that will take you to where your data is. Um, but anyway, for the moment, let's just quickly start by looking at the attribute table, open attribute table. And we can see we have an attribute table here that is empty. There are three columns. We've got an ID column and we've got uh, these two, this type or type and type chord. So these are three different columns, uh, but there are no objects in it. It's a completely empty uh, data uh, table, but we have these predefined qualities that any object might be able to have, attributes. Um, if we right click again and go to properties here, uh, here we have a whole lot of information we can look at. We'll get back to this symbology later, but let's just start with information. Um, and this tells us where the, the, the data for this layer is being stored. And we can see that the, the, the path to the, um, the data storage is, if we read this here, we can see it is this GPKG uh, file uh, under the edit folder. So that's uh, pretty much as expected. Can close that down again. Um, and it's actually being stored in that package as a layer called, uh, in this case, Marikteke, which is the Swedish word for, for land cover. And I just um, implemented it with Swedish spelling to begin with, or Swedish words to begin with, and changed to English afterwards. So the, 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 the table that is um, storing, that will store the, the land use data is called this, but it's in this geo package. This is like a geo database, uh, similar to a geo database in, in the world of ESRI. Uh, we can also read which coordinate system is uh, being used here. Um, at the moment, there are no other details really um, relevant or, or, or available because there's no data in the, in, in the file. If we click on source. There's not a huge amount of information that we can get from here. We can, if we like, change the, the name of the layer. This won't change what it's called in the database, in the geo package, but it will change how it's displayed here in, the, in this table of contents. Uh, if you like, we, you can change it to something else. Now uh, we can also see which coordinate system is being used. We could, if we want, change the coordinate system. Don't just leave it as it is right now, the SWEREF 99TM, the, the Swedish National Grid. 
The other two things that we could uh, look at, or two or three things we can look at really is symbology. This you will work with very probably, almost certainly, uh, and labels. For land use, maybe you won't be using the labels. Um, at the moment, there are no labels set, um, but we could choose to use uh, single labels and pick up information from that, but we won't be using labels for the land use. On the other layers, we will be using labels. Um, one final thing to look at maybe is this attributes form. Um, what this is, uh, I will explain later um, in more detail when we come to actually doing some uh, mapping. But with this, we can help to control, we can make life a little easier when we're uh, actually mapping by giving us some standard values to call upon when we make a new object. Um, we could look at the fields here. This is, again, basically a description of the table, but not the contents, but how the, the table is, is constructed. With the attributes, we can see we've got these column headers again, and what type of data they store. We can see that this, we have a string here, which is text, and then an inter, integer values down here. We don't worry about this one because we're not going to fill that in. That's automatically updated for us. But this, this is an integer value, and this is a, a piece of text. But what we're going to focus on now is the symbology. So if we look at the symbology of this one, it's being controlled by, uh, we, we have uh, categorized here. Uh, so we're looking through the data and we're finding categories of data in our file. At the moment, it's empty. So there are really, there's, there's nothing in there to categorize, but we could in theory categorize it by the contents of this field in the table, this, uh, this T chord. This was the integer value coding uh, the last column of the file, uh, which is what we're using here, where it says value there. That means it's going to look in this column of the table and it's going to look for the, these values. So if it finds a value three, then it says, well, that must be coniferous forest. Why is it coniferous forest? Because I wrote that three is coniferous forest. You can go in and change this text if you want. Uh, you can call it uh, um, Bariskog or which, whatever you want to call it. Um, but we can also change the symbol here. We can go in and the symbol looks like this at the moment. Now we can use these standard symbols if you want, if we just want to click on one of these, it'll change it. Or we can go into, we can actually mark this simple fill here and we can see the fill color. And this is a simple fill and we've got, uh, it's gonna be a dark green color. It's gonna be solid, painted solid, as you can see there. Stroke, that's the line around the border of it. Would be black, but there is no, it's not going to be painted. We've chosen no pen, uh, so there is no border. Uh, if I were to change that to a solid line, maybe you can see now that that's uh, increased to, a, if I make it thicker, we're using this, you can see there's now a border. I don't want a border around it. I don't think it's a border is a good idea for these land cover classes. So I'll take that back to no pen. If I want to make a, a more detailed symbol, which isn't always a good idea, I can add another fill here. If I click on that, that and then maybe put on some sort of point pattern like that. And that point will be repeated at particular intervals across my uh, across this area. Avoid these kinds of things. They, they can be helpful, but they can also be very uh, very messy and, and not very clear for the, for the car, uh, for the map reader. We get rid of that. Just leave it as it was simply there. So that's the the coniferous woodland. Um, and at the bottom, we have this um, all other values. So if I, if I map an object and I'm not sure what it is, and I don't want to give it this, this code, I don't want to say what it is, I can just not bother giving a code and it will end up being a white square or a, a, a white form, a white shape. I can change that if I like. I can go in and change the color of that. Uh, if I do this, I can just maybe make it gray, for example. Now it becomes almost invisible there, but we can do that. And now you can see that there's a gray square there. Now, I think I'll change that back to white simply to indicate that it is not uh, anything. There we go, change that to white. Okay, so that's just a sort of unspecified background color. If I want to add a new layer, we will we'll, 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 we'll do that here. If I want to add a new type of object, we can do that in here. But we'll come back to that once we've, we've mapped an object. So if we click on cancel for now there, and we can see that in all of these, we have this similar structure. We have the attribute table with, uh, with, with some, that's completely empty, but it has these columns with a text and, a, and an integer value uh, column. So we can store data in those. And then we go to properties, 
And we look here at the symbology and we have a similar structure from this integer value column, the, 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 the type code. Uh, it looked for a value there, a value that I've entered. I said, if it has a value one, then it's a residential single household, a villa. And it gets that symbol. And that symbol has been constructed like that. It's a very simple symbol. Uh, so this is exactly the same sort of structure as in the, the land use. But these are intended, this, this building's layer, uh, as you can see, is a little higher up. It's, it lies above the land use layer, which means that we can cover an area with, say, residential housing, uh, an area that is residential. You can see there we have this residential there. And then we can put individual houses on that residential area. So we have an area code and then more areas that are and act, uh, actual buildings. Uh, so that's so these are also areas, so we can draw different shapes. We could, in some maps, we might represent houses with a point symbol, just a standard square, but then we don't say anything about the form of the house. It's just a, it's just a symbolization that it is a house. We're, we're going to be working at such a scale now. We've quite, kind of zoomed in. We've got a fairly small area to work with, so we can actually draw the buildings approximately to their correct shape. Which is slightly more informative. If we were more zoomed out, if we were working on a, 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 at a different scale, if our map, intended map scale, was say a hundred thousand, uh, we might just want to represent buildings with, with with a symbol, with a point symbol, rather than an, an area symbol. But now we're going to use an area symbol. The next layer up, which will be drawn over any area symbols, are the line symbols, and in this case, it's the transport. Most of the lines we're looking at here are transports, roads, railways, footpaths, that sort of thing. And once again, it's a very similar construction. We have our attribute table here. Uh, here we have an extra class, uh, sorry, an extra column called class, uh, because we might want to describe the width of the road. Um, so if we, if we want to scale perhaps our symbols um, by the width of the road, rather than giving them a hard fixed uh, dimension, we might want to scale it according to this. Perhaps, we don't have to but we have the possibility here. We also have, uh, for, for future reference, this, as I said before, this is still a text. Uh, this is still string, as you can see here, it says string, which means that we could put street names in there, which could be handy for labeling later so that in our map, we can tell what road is what. So that works in exactly the same way. If we go to the properties, uh, we can see we have, again, it's using the type code to uh, identify uh, what class a particular thing belongs to. And in this case, let's say it's a class seven object. It's a dual carriageway. So it's, uh, there are two uh, lanes on each side. So if we click on that, here we can see a slightly more uh, detailed construction, uh, a lot more intricacy to how this is built up. We can see that this symbol consists of this sort of orangey beige color in the background. And then we have these side lines on each side and then a central line, which is a dotted line. So if we click on this bottom line, it's at the bottom of the list, so it's drawn first. And we can see that it's got this color, the stroke width is just over three millimeters and it's a solid line, not much more detail there. There's no offset. We go to this simple line and it's uh, a lot thinner. It's only half a millimeter, it's black, and it's got an offset of 1.8 millimeters. If you remember that was three, just over three, so that pushes that line out to, to the side. And then this one has got a negative offset, so it's on the other side of the line. And then if we look at this, this line, it's not got any offset, it's in the middle, uh, but it's a dash line. We've got this, we have several different dashes we could use. So it's a dash line, so we get this appearance. We can make these even more complicated, this custom dash pattern, but for now, let's just keep things simple. So that's how uh, the, that line symbol is constructed. And we can go in and we can adjust the width of this. We can adjust the width of individual pieces, or we can adjust the width of the entire symbol by clicking up here again for the whole thing. And then we can just increase or decrease the width of it like that. And you can see here that becomes bigger. Or we can take it down again, smaller. So we, we've got quite a lot of flexibility in what and, and how we can adjust those symbols. Let's just get out of there and we'll take a quick look now at the point symbols. Now these two are for points. This one is for vegetation objects, that's what it says. Um, and this is for uh, infrastructure. You may want to use this for, for individual symbols for shops or for whatever it is you're going to map. Um, but you could also create your own layer. 
We'll talk about creating your own layer in a separate video that comes in a minute. But for now, let's just look at how these symbols are constructed. Again, just quickly to show that we have, we have this same columns. And here we have another column called dimension. If you want to represent trees, if they become bigger, the symbol for the tree becomes bigger because of the size of the tree, you could control it with that, for example. But the properties here, uh, symbology, again, controlled by this type code. Uh, and then we have, uh, if you've got a value of one, then it is a deciduous tree, uh, love school or love trout. Uh, and the symbol, if we click on that, we can see in a similar way to how the line symbols made, this is made up or just by collecting together lots of different, these so-called simple markers. So this is just a circle. You can see we have a circle down there. I've picked out that circle from there and I've colored it uh, green with no border. And then we have another simple marker here, which is also a circle, slightly different color and a little bit of an offset so that it's uh, not centered on the middle. So we get this pattern of uh, different circles to make something that looks like a tree, sort of. Uh, I can make this again, same thing if I mark up here, I can make this a little bit bigger so that it becomes perhaps clearer what's happened. Uh, we can see that this is just a collection of these different circles, all of these in here, uh, make up this big image there. I'll click on cancel for that. So that's how that point symbol is made up. The last one, also point symbols, We'll just quickly look at this. This is slightly different, how the symbols are made by, everything else is the same, but the actual symbol itself, we're using a so-called so SVG marker. Now SVG, if you remember, that was, there was a folder called My SVGs. there's a clue there. But what this is, is a standard vector uh, image. If we look down here, if we, if, if instead of having um, a mask or a simple marker, we choose this SVG marker, then when we go down to the bottom, instead of this circle or square or what have you, we have access to a whole load of these different so-called SVG markers, pretty patterns and markers that look like that. Uh, very many different ones, uh, all here grouped together. We even have, uh, hopefully this link should be maintained, access to the, the SVG files in this My SVG folder. If you don't, don't worry about it, we'll, we'll sort that out at some other time. But here we can import one of these symbols. Now, the problem with these symbols is they have no background. Um, if we look here, uh, this is actually just the white symbol itself here for the, for the train. And then it's transparent where it isn't white. So I've put in this blue background, this simple marker for a blue background with a white border. That you can see here that makes that white border just to, to frame the symbol like that. So that was a slightly different type of marker. Otherwise, everything else functions exactly the same as the, as the other uh, point markers there. So that, those are the different layers, um, polygons, lines and points, and accessing the styling for them, what information in there. In the next film, we'll look at actually creating objects and start doing some mapping.